Okay, well, hello, welcome uh, to this workshop about uh, creation of uh, non-state institutions, okay? Um, this will be a workshop that will mimic the idea of the, the, the summit, okay? It's, it's not a class, but it's an exchange uh, where everybody can teach and learn, okay? There are interesting experiences, and we'll start with uh, three presentations. Uh, our speakers are uh, Saki Hall from uh, Cooperation Jackson, then Thomas from Institute of Political Ecology, um, the Zagreb, Croatia, and then Sinab Sharkani from, this is the longest, uh, foreign representative of democratic administration um, in north of Syria. <laughs> um, then the dynamics of the workshop will be to for two parts, okay? Then uh, first, there will be the presentations, and then we'll have a uh, group work, okay? Because of the size of the room, we will have to leave the room and work so we can divide in three groups, one per speaker, okay? I will explain further uh, the dynamics, okay? Um, then, well, we can already uh, let the speaker start if the technical issues are Saki, you're okay? Okay. Then uh, we'll make a general introduction of the importance of the institutions with a discussion from the speakers, and then we'll go to concrete uh, experiences. There will be a focus on strategies. So the idea is to leave the workshop with a toolbox with strategies that can be helpful for uh, projects you may have, okay? So, uh, Saki. Okay. This is for the camera, not for everyone to. Can you can you hear? Is it for yeah? Okay, you can't really hear. I have to project this just for you. Okay. Um, okay. So we're actually gonna. Federico might have said this already. Probably said this already. We're gonna start with a like big question, uh, looking at the macro, and discuss for maybe about five ten minutes, uh, and then we'll go into our presentations. So the question posed is, why is it important what we're talking about the municipal framework, right, for this whole gathering? Um, and so why is it important to have non-state institutions uh, and particularly to have them connected to political movements? Um, so we're going to kind of open up the floor and discuss that and then we'll move forward. Uh, Tom, do you want to go first? Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, this is so weird to speak on the mic and not to hear anything. <laughs> but we'll do our best. Uh, well, I, I think, uh, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm a researcher and an activist. I work, uh, I was an activist uh, in the right to the city uh, for a long time in Zagreb. But also I'm a researcher on the issue of the commons, which is, I guess, uh, the, the framework which comes to everybody's minds when we speak about the non-state institutions and new models of the governance of the resources and uh, new kind of models for social relations. Uh, but also, um, uh, just recently in Zagreb, we had a kind of a political uh, uh, process uh, to establish a political platform similar to Barcelona and Comú. And we managed to get to the city council of Zagreb. We won four seats. So this was done by the, mostly by the activists from the social movements. And then, of course, uh, we had these big debates about the power and the counter power. So whenever we speak about municipalism, whenever we talk about the new way of doing local politics, even if uh, some of our comrades went enter into the power, into the state power, or let's say the local government, then, of course, uh, still is the issue, or even more is the issue, to make a case for non-state institutions of resource governance, of social reproduction, uh, which are autonomous to the state power. So for me, uh, to have non-state institutions uh, is a very important part of uh, not making the same mistakes which left historically does whenever left goes into the state power and then kind of forgets about the people, uh, uh, things that they can re represent everybody from the popular movements and then things go wrong. So I would say this for me is the important step why we need to have a lot of new models of governance of non-state institutions. Okay. 
Hi, everybody. Uh, I am representing the autonomous region of the uh, north of Syria, which is near part Rojava. But when we talk about non-state institutions, that means we have to have the, uh, the decentralized system in the region. Always the state nations brings with it a very uh, difficult and unsolved problem. What is happening now in our Middle East, it is one of the ex examples. For instance, in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya, in Tunisia, in Egypt, everywhere now in the Middle East we have conflicts. So the state, the nation states, it brings with it many problems for its people inside the country as well as with the neighboring countries outside. And this is what's happened for Iraq and Syria now. The nation states depends on one nation, one language, one culture, one flag. Non-states which depends on the democratic nation. The democratic nations that mean all the nations who are living in one geographical area can share together, can live together, can share the, and in the administration together. So for that, when you have the centralized system which depends on the government or all these things, everything will be on the hand of the authority. The sounds of the people will be here very weak, but the decentralized, as we have now in Rojava, we have practical now, practice it. We have the, the democratic administration, which depends on the people of this area. They are ruling themselves by themselves. Through councils, we start from common councils of the villages, the cities, the, the region, and the whole area. So this is which we are now having in Rojava. Can uh, I have the presentation now? Or no, I will, uh, well, after that, okay. So for, uh, I will not, uh, maybe now I talk after that about our system, but I always say the non-state institutions, it strengthens the sound of the people there. It strengthens the needs of the people in this area. Institution as municipalities, as the uh, hospitals, any things, any institution in the area, it will be very strong if it has non-state institutions, but when it is uh, uh, depending on the state or the nation state, that it will be working according to the need of the authority, not to the need of the people. And this is what we are practicing now in Rojava. Thank you. Okay. Is the computer in the way? Do I need to move down a little bit? Um, so, I'll be quick. Um, I wanted to follow up with what Tom said, uh, which is relevant to the example in Jackson, Mississippi, right? So, uh, in, in terms of the second part of the question, you know, um, you guys spoke really well about why it's important for non-state institutions, um, and particularly that are connected with political projects, right? So. You know, for us, if it's not connected to a political project, then um, then it's not really able to be transformative, right? And so a lot of times what you see, especially when I start talking about the cooperative movement in the United States, um, they get stuck in a capitalist framework. Um, and one example in Jackson, uh, this past Tuesday, we, and when I say we, I mean, the political organization that I belong to, uh, the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, just won for the second time the mayoral seat, right? <laughs> um, and one of the challenges is that Jackson is in a really bad position as a city, especially as a city in the state of Mississippi. Um, and so one of the challenges is really gonna be uh, being in a state power and having to manage austerity. 
So because of that reason and many other reasons, it's really important to be able to have state institutions that are connected to political movements uh, and using some of the practices that they've already mentioned, uh, like people's assemblies and really from the ground up work that can serve as a dual power, right? And so not being, not necessarily relying or not relying at all <laughs> on the state institutions, even if you have a favorable, go favorable government or even if you have um, allies in the government and in our case, our political social representative in government. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'll talk a little bit more about the dual power relationship. Okay. And actually, <laughs> I'm actually going first in the presentation. So I'm going to move over just a little bit and try to slide this. Over here, okay. I'm gonna give just a few, um, just a few slides to go along with speaking. Um, one, of the way, one of the things that's really important for us, especially as a community of African people in the United States, um, is the idea of self-determination. Uh, this woman, Fannie Lou Hamer, is from Mississippi, and a lot of people are used to her as being a person and a leader within the civil rights movement. She also um, was a leader within this idea of land, land being necessary for liberation, and also cooperatives, actually, which I didn't learn until I moved to Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and so a really important piece that I'm not gonna go into very much is the Jackson Cush plan. Um, and there's like this three-prong strategy um, with really the top and the grounding and the foundation being within people assemblies. Um, the independent politics, which I just mentioned. And then finally, the solidarity economy. Um, and Cooperation Jackson is really the institution that is uh, attempting, working, building uh, towards this solidarity economy. I'm gonna leave it up there for a minute. So, you know, we're really working towards the solidarity economy and we see that as being anchored by a network of cooperatives and the network is really critical in terms of being interdependent um, and in terms of thinking about intersectionality and the needs that the community has and the thought around the solutions um, being possibly addressed through the cooperative model and developing different cooperatives that meet those needs. Um, so we really see ourselves, and we just turned three years old in May, we really see ourselves as an emerging institution for community development, really community ownership, which we feel is critical when you're talking about self-determination and liberation. Um, Community-based development, because we see in our community and in communities across the United States, uh, gentrification and displacement that is really um, being pushed forward not only by the state, but by corporations. Um, you know, so, and then the other piece is economic democracy. So like ultimately, we're talking about a democratic process that not only is in the uh, political realm, but is also in um, the economic basis of how we even own the means of production, right? So we, we and this is to give a little bit of background um, on who we are before I go into some of the um, methods and strategies. Um, so we're a multinational organization, although we um, are black-led and really focusing on uh, building power uh, in African communities, black liberation and self-determination, as I mentioned. Um, 
And so we are based on being able to be self-organized um, and localized, very local. Uh, and I think most people in the room already understand the importance of the local level, the municipal level. And for us in the United States, especially in the current context, um, and then definitely in Mississippi, like what you hear about what's happening in the United States nationally with Trump and everything else has been the situation in Mississippi for a really long time, right? And so Jackson in a lot of ways is um, a democratic island in the middle of a state sea <laughs> of Republicans. Right now in Mississippi, we have the Republicans are a super majority. Um, and so the divestment in Jackson has continued and really the situation is that the state can come in and decide what the city can and can't do right so on that local level there are a lot of constraints um, even when we have uh, progressive or somewhat progressive ideas and policies coming out of the city or trying to come out of the city um, and so that's another reason why at that local level it's so critical to be able to have these non-state institutions that can really push and hold the city state <laughs> um, governments accountable um, and so we're up against a really strong uh, neoliberal ne neoliberalism austerity i mentioned gentrification which is really displacement and mass displacement of uh, black communities in the United States in uh, big urban cities and early er areas. Um, and of course, structural racism and white supremacy. So uh, one last thing, to mention the different frameworks that we use. Um, there, we use a number of different frameworks and see them as overlapping and, inter and having intersections. And so this idea of a just transition is really about a transition away from the extractive economy um, through like extractive in so many ways in terms of our bodies, labor, resources, natural resources um, that's put forward through systems of oppression, right? And to transition away from that towards uh, sustainable people-centered, earth-centered practices. Um, and then we also actually expand the idea of human rights, and we, um, we use and are trying to develop even further what we call a people-centered human rights. And so that's really about being grassroots, bottom-up, um, seeing the right that we have to the city in order to remain and rebuild, um, and what we have been trying to um, institute in Jackson and really Cooperation Jackson has been a catalyst for a coalition um, that's working on a grassroots bottom-up process to create a human rights charter. Um, and through that process, which we actually haven't started yet, the importance of being like neighborhood-based and community-based and building towards um, the development of the human rights charter the people themselves being able to identify um, what the human rights violations are and to be able to come up with those solutions that will be based in the charter. And then not only a charter, right, we have to have a commission and actually, um, so this is like the non-state people part, but we definitely do in order to uphold human rights and uh, in order to hold um, the state accountable and the different mechanisms that can be created in order to uphold a charter, um, we have to have a commission. Um, and so that's one piece of what we see as critical in being able to protect the alternative institutions and the alternative models that are being created. Um, another thing that's really important is this idea of intersectionality um, that really comes out of the uh, black and women of color um, thinking, uh, gatherings, uh, study. And that is not only about the intersections of our social identities, and so I'm, a, I'm black, I'm a woman, I'm a mother, um, I'm still somewhat young. <laughs> um, 
it's not it's not only about those overlapping and intersecting identities it's also uh about being able to center those who are most marginalized especially in situations where they are um the people who have to come up with the solutions and so still that idea is really critical for the work that we're doing um, on the local level because we can't have top down even within our own like communities and grassroots organizations we can't have this grass tops be the one to determine what is important for the different communities um, and so it's really about being able to being able to analyze um, oppression and systems of oppression and also not just analyze but create tools and understand that in different situations we play different roles um, but that it's an ongoing uh, it's an ongoing struggle and an ongoing critical point to be able to to question that and to shift away from that especially culturally um, is there another one so I won't go into the municipalism that we've already talked about. Um, and I want to skip down to another slide. And these are some pictures um, that maybe I'll get to show later, but um, not necessarily now. OK. <coughs> and so for, you know, for a long time, forever, um, and even uh, now, we see a heightened need to fight. Um, the important part of what we're doing is not only to have to react to um, the reactionary forces that are against us, but it's also to build, right? And so our work is really about being able to build multiple institutions. And so, but you see it overlapping with the city. Um, and so the green worker and community cooperatives I'm going to get to as particularly a focus that we have, although we understand how things are connected and that we can't, we really can't only focus on that. That's one piece of the pie, right? And so uh, within that and connected to that is this idea of community production um, and cooperatives that are centered for community production. And I already mentioned how important it is, especially if you're trying to shift away um, from this capital modest uh, model to be able to have communities uh, own, uh, be able to create production and own the different chains within, um, within the work uh, and within the means of production. I, I mentioned the Human Rights Institute already, um, and then really looking at the web of um, that can be created in the Echo Village, along with that education of the just transition that I talked about. And so I need some water. Oh, uh, yes. This one. Okay. Thanks. I'm used to PowerPoint and not. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm going to take a minute because I feel like I have cotton mouth to <laughs> drink some water. Okay. Can you guys see that? So I'm, I'm going to point to a few of these, right? So overlapping in this red with the uh, worker cooperatives we have. <laughs> is that a lot better? OK. Um, <laughs> the idea of creating a solidary city and so bringing it from a very micro level of like neighborhoods um, and communities into um, the larger uh, context of the city. Um, and so in order to build and protect uh, the community cooperatives, uh, particularly we're working on worker cooperatives, um, we see the importance of actual policies and programs that support the cooperative development. Um, and when we are looking at this community production, a really exciting thing that we've been working on recently and 
Um, uh, and it's exciting because the building of it is really starting to take off. Um, is this idea of a fab city. Um, and actually Barcelona is like the first fab city in uh, the world. Um, and so again, being able to have policies and programs that support this community production and technology democracy, right? And so when we look at fab labs, fabrication labs, like 3D printing, et cetera, um, right now, at least, it's a big opportunity and a window for communities to be able to um, use technology to meet the needs, uh, which is, you know, largely and increasingly being, um, being used by companies um, in order to be able to shift the, the landscape and be able to answer and respond to people being able to create their own products, right? So I'm gonna try to go a little bit faster. Um, I talked about the human rights city um, and then you know, looking at the Echo Village as a model and really, again, talking about the just transition, um, education within the community um, and really putting those um, plans into place. There are, again, a need for policy and programs that really support clean energy and zero waste. Um, and so we have a whole platform on sustainable city stuff, which I can give you the website for you to learn a little bit more about that. Um, this is going to be 15. This is another look at just kind of like the cooperatives um, within the Sustainable Communities Initiative. Um, these cooperatives being interlinked and connected to this Echo Village, but also the importance, no. Um, it's hard to see here at the bottom. Is it going away? At the bottom, oh, you can't even see it. There's a community land trust. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Um, and the community land trust I'm really excited about, that's one of the things that my work has been focused on. Um, and for anyone who doesn't necessarily know about community land trust, um, we don't see it as the end all be all, but we see it as a step towards really being able to um, decommodify land and housing, right? And so land and housing isn't something that we individually own or that corporations own or that landlords own. It's really a model where the community owns and manages the land. Um, and for us, although a focus in the United States is really on um, housing and particularly independent um, home ownership, for us, the community land trust um, is about being able to take land off the market, especially when we're looking at the increase of gentrification in Jackson. Um, and then also, it is about creating permanently affordable housing, which is a basis of community land trust in, um, when we look at the model in the US. Um, but it's also a way for, again, the communities to decide what it is that we want to use for land. So in Jackson, Mississippi, you have whole blocks where land is empty, where housing is um, vacant and dilapidated. And near where I live in West Jackson, there are actually blocks that have been like reclaimed um, by mother, you know, uh, by nature. Um, and so even though it's an urban area, you can go to areas in West Jackson where, you know, a block can look like a forest. Um, and so, you know, so, as we see a lot of the signs of what has happened in other big cities in the United States, like New York and Atlanta um, and the Bay Area and San Francisco, we see the community land trust and actually our own version of acquiring land. And it puts you in an awkward position because you are a developer. But the idea is to be a developer that is um, responsible to and being built up by the community. Um, and so that's one of the ways that we um, are trying to institute uh, community ownership, um, community development where people are deciding we want a park, we want a playground, we want housing, we want commercial space for the cooperatives. Um, one of the co-ops that has taken off in the last um, two years is our urban farming um, worker co-op. So I'm just gonna slide to the last one. Um, and again, this is another way of looking at all these different pieces um, of the of the web 
Um, I actually want to make this so that it's not only the Sustainable Communities Initiative going out to all these things, but we see how they're um, connected. Um, and so some of these things we haven't, you know, gotten to. It's something that is um, a more long-term um, focus. But even being able to create the alternative models with not necessarily using currency in the way that we do now, right? So thinking about time banking, um, creating alternative currencies. And a lot of these things are actually, have been done in other places. And so we're really trying to learn, um, particularly on an international level, about how we do that within the context of where we live. So I'm going to go back up and leave it on self-determination. Um, and so talking about methods, have I gone to my 15 minutes? OK. So maybe within the question and discussion period, I'll be able to bring up um, more things. OK. Hi, everybody, uh, once again. So I'll, uh, my presentation will focus uh, on uh, non-state institutions in Croatia, but actually I'll talk more about, about this uh, division between state and non-state, which I see also to some extent artificial in a way. And I'll talk about these fringes between the state and non-state, some kind of hybrid institutions that we are trying to experiment in Croatia. So uh, first about some conceptual framework, which I will not, I promise, go into details. Uh, and we can talk about this in discussion, also about you know, what is the state, uh, what is the theory of the state which, which we take, the Marxist, the liberal, and what is the difference between the commons and the state, etc. I mean, uh, I actually write about this in the article called Commonizing the State, which is supposed to be published this year, uh, about how, how, how actually if it to take a look at the state as some kind of super community governance regime. If we take for granted that, that we need some, some kind of coordination between different communities, if we think that we need some kind of redistribution of resources which are unequally distributed between the communities, then we need some kind of super community governance regime. And we can call it state, we can uh, transform it in a way that it's not nation state, but we definitely need some kind of super community governance regime, at least in my opinion, for, kind of for solving issues like climate change, for redistributing unequally distributed uh, resources, for natural reasons, for social reasons, etc., etc. But uh, to give you a context first about the Croatia, uh, and you have to look at the, a bit of the geography of Croatia to understand the structure of the economy of Croatia and the social conflict, which is the main social conflict. It's all about, first of all, Croatia is, maybe some of you don't know, is a post-socialist country which went to a very violent uh, neoliberal transition in the past 25 years. And after the first accumulation by dispossession, which happened through privatization of socially owned factories and companies and uh, apartments, social housing was privatized, et cetera, et cetera, uh, this capital had to be invested, and it was invested in land. So what happened was the so-called the second pri privatization haste, uh, as called by my colleagues, Medak and Selakovsky, which means that this capital was invested in land, and then we had the state, of course, helping, basically in legalizing the, the, the land grab uh, through different laws like law on golf courses, etc. And of course, the reason for that is the Croatian Adriatic coast, uh, where the biggest uh, pressure is to privatize the land for big uh, touristic uh, golf course, uh, real estate developments, etc., etc. So th this is where the most of the conflict, the social conflicts, lie. And that's why I'll focus uh, on two cities. One is in Pula, on the coast, uh, where I will ex explain some one of the cases of uh, this kind of hybrid institutional model for governing a cultural center, social cult cultural center. And the second I'll talk about in Zagreb about this uh, water service privatization, but also 
some kind of alternative models for water services. So I'll talk mostly about this social cultural center and water services as an example. So uh, the social cultural center Reut, uh, that's the name, um, is basically, you can see it on the picture, it's the biggest building in the city of Pula. It's, uh, it's uh, basically used by the military since the 19th century and uh, it has 20,000 square meter surface of the floor. So it's really huge, huge building and has even more five hectares of surrounding land, land area. When you look at the short history of this building and its usage, so after the 1991, it was abandoned by the Yugoslav uh, military. As you know, Croatia was in war since that time and uh, until 1997, this building was used for refugees, uh, for war refugees uh, in that war period. After that, after the refugees uh, left and uh, the, the war has finished, uh, different independent cultural organizations, uh, artists started to squat the building. And then in 1999, the city of Pula wanted to legalize this in a way or to find some kind of formal way, so they started to sign first contracts uh, for use of this uh, building. And then in 2002, the city administration wanted to initiate a multimedia center in this building and uh, there were more and more informal users of this building. And uh, in 2004, there were around 80 organizations which were using this building, coming from different areas, for using it for social work, for child care, non-formal chi child care, for uh, artists, for uh, environmental pollution, for education, et cetera, et cetera. And they decided as users, they decided to establish an alliance. So they. Uh, basically established an alliance of all the organizations which are using this in order to confront the local government more easily and trying to kind of get the status of the usage recognized by the local government. So in 2008, what they managed to do is that they managed to establish a kind of hybrid structure of co-management between the local government and the users and the association of the users. So association of the users elected the representatives which would go into co-management co body so free representatives by the users of the roids elected on this association uh, assembly, plenary, and then from the other side, the free representatives of the city administration of Pula. And they tried to, uh, what? Yeah, free, free. So it was equal kind of 50%, uh, 50% co-management principle. And together, they would co-manage the building. And it would be co-managed in a way that the city would cover all the maintenance costs and uh, also the manage it in a way for maintenance, and the users will decide how the building will be used by themselves. So uh, first of, of course, I mean, I'll show you some pictures. I mean, you can imagine 20,000 square meters of abandoned military complex. Uh, it, it looked very much as some kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, apocalypse movie in the beginning, and they started to kind of, you know, make it more cheerful. So they, I think now there's 4,000 square meters of, um, uh, wall murals, so paintings on the wall, which was done uh, by different artists from all around the world. Then uh, there were, in this was 2009 picture, more and more users started to use it. So it was not just, you know, the squatters, the punk culture, etc. It was the whole community for different uh, users started to uh, legally or illegally use the building. But of course, this was not easy. I mean, the local government at some point in 2009 said, no, 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 I mean, we are the owners of the building. I mean, you don't have right to use it, uh, or we don't, we don't want to give you that power that you decide how it will be used, and we just pay the bills. And then this was the protest that the association of users organized in front of the building, confront the local government, and then local government said, okay, we'll do it this way. And this was, it's important to say this, uh, and that's why I gave you this context, that all the time there were some kind of social conflicts between these movements and the government on some other issues as well. One of the issues was that, uh, Peninsula, which was used by military called Mozil, is one-fifth of the surface of the whole city, and the government recently, a few years ago, wanted to give that whole peninsula into concession on 99 years to one private developer, which would be completely luxurious, tourist, ghettoized, uh, non-accessible for a local public content. And, this, and the whole building was protesting against the government, in the same time co-managing the building with the government. So this was a very, it's very interesting how this uh, relationship is very conflictual, and then, you know, changing strategies and tactics. So it was not an easy piece, but all the time some kind of tensions and conflicts, but, but it still works. I mean, 
if you we'll look at it today, it's, uh, this hybrid model is very functional and we try to copy this model in different other cities of Croatia. Uh, association of the users is still deciding on, uh, uh, on the, the, the use, while the city of Pula is uh, paying all the costs for maintenance. The usage, users of the, of the building, all of them, and they are all uh, non-formal associations, formal associations, etc. individual users, they all have to pay just for the electricity. Everything else is covered by the city. Uh, now there are 110 organizations as users. As you can see, 34 are art and culture, 22 sport and recreation, 10 national minorities, uh, uh, technical culture, four of them, war veterans, psychosocial work uh, done for community, children, for children and youth, etc., etc. So it's a very wide kind of variety of users, really by the whole community, not just one, you know, usual sus suspects of the left type of community. So. Um, I'll skip to the second uh, case, which is in Zagreb. Am I doing okay with time? Yeah. So about the water services in Zagreb area. So I'm coming from Zagreb. Uh, as I said, my background is from the right to the city, environmental justice, uh, and uh, and also as researcher in the Institute for Political Ecology, uh, I worked a lot on the issues of the public utilities, and that's something some where I want to discuss these state non-state institutions. So first of all, about the, what's the current situation in Zagreb, so by the law in Croatia, and this is what we fought for, it's not possible to have private companies distributing water by the law. So nowhere in Croatia private companies are distributing water, and we fought for this uh, for years. It's also not possible to have uh, wa wastewater distribution or sewage service done by private companies. What is possible, however, is to have wastewater treatment service being done by private companies. And this loophole in the law was used only by two cities in Croatia, and one of them, unfortunately, is Zagreb. And it was done through public-private partnership model. This is the wastewater treatment plant facility. It was, the contract was signed uh, between the city of Zagreb and two private companies in 2000. It was built in uh, 2002, and it had, was operational in 2007. It was, uh, the contract was signed uh, on 20 years, 28 years uh, concession with two companies, both of them are from Germany and Austria. So R R RWE, RWE, as you know, is a huge uh, multinational company based in Germany, and Wasser Technik, and it was a BOT model, okay. So it was supposed to be 100 million euros investment, 28 years contract, so basically seven Governments cannot change the contract, otherwise you pay huge penalties, which would put the city of Zagreb into bankruptcy. So, this kind of democracy. Uh, so, uh, so what happened? This contract was never published, so it's not accessible to the public. We don't know what we signed. Uh, it had 117 requests for annexes. We don't know how many annexes to the contract there are, but minimum are 80. So 8-0 annexes to the contract so far have been made. Uh, in last, until this uh, contract was signed, the, the, the household, the water prices, because it's all together paid, uh, you pay for the water distribution, for the sewage, and for the wastewater treatment. And because of that, the water prices in Zagreb went 300% in the last 15 years, both for households and for the industry. Which, why? Because the annual profit for these two private companies is, because we don't know what's in the contract, but the state audit office report can get the contract, and they said in their report that uh, it gets 40% annual profit rate for these two private companies until 2028. So uh, very big, I, you know, if you know the, how much is the normal, normal profit rate, I mean, you know, this is, this is like basically drug trafficking in a way. Uh, so it's one billion euros of income uh, for the investors while they invested only 300 million euros. Uh, and then the situation with the water distribution now is that 50% of the water is leaking from the pipes, which are old, which are not maintained well, there's no investment in the water infrastructure, so 50% of the water is ruined, I mean, go, goes as a waste. In EU average is around 10%, so we are five times more than that. And still, around 6,000 households in the city of Zagreb doesn't have running water. So the capital of Croatia, I mean, member of the EU, 
still 6,000 households don't have running water. 12,000 households don't have sewage system uh, with their household in the city of Zagreb. Uh, and of course, I mean, we looked at this, you know, this is the private model, I mean. And then, you know, the public situation, as you see, is also not great. I mean, we have a lot of corruption cases within the public water companies. Political parties are employing their own members there. All of the public tenders are basically rigged. So the companies who get the public tenders by the public water company are the same companies which are financing the same political party in power. So the public is corrupted. The public, the private is shitty, I mean, for users, for the infrastructure, for uh, the price. So, you know, what is the alternative? And then we try to look at different alternatives around the world. And in Europe, we, we have this care, uh, case of Paris water, Eau de Paris. I mean, here are people from France, so I'm sure they can t tell more about this. I mean, but looking at different privatization of water services in Grenoble, in, in Paris, they try to, when they brought it back into the public, they try to see, okay, but how do we don't have it as the old public? How do we democratize it? How do we have a s wide social control over the public company? And then again, how do we make mechanisms that the society defines what is the public interest that the public water company should fulfill? Because it's not profit. If it's profit, then let it be private. The public water company should satisfy some public interest and the public is the one who should define what is this public interest. So what, so what are the criteria? How do we assess what is the successful management of the public water company? It's not the annual profit rate at the end. So it should be some environmental, some social, you know, different gender criteria, the worker rights criteria, the environmental sustainability criteria, and then based on these criteria to assess if the public water company is managed well or not. And how do we make sure through different uh, representatives of different social groups put on management or at least in supervisory board that they are actually controlling that political parties are not using the public companies for their own interests. So they are, you know, basically they are called public but they are for private interest. So how do we make sure that in that? So there are different, I won't go in details now on different models of how this works or not. This is a rather new model in Paris. In Grenoble it functions for I think 15 years already, so they have much more experience in that. You heard yesterday uh, the mayor of Grenoble, Eric Piol, was here. I think he's still here. So actually the Green Left Coalition went to power in Grenoble because of the war against the privatization of the water. So there was a huge social movement against the privatization of the water in Grenoble and this made it into Green Left Coalition, which went to power, but when they went to power, they said, the people said, no, 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 it, w it will not be as the old public water company. Now we want to control it. And they made all these mechanisms how the society is actually controlling the, the public. And that's why I say, you know, is it state, is it non-state institution? I don't know, it's some kind of hybrid, but I think we should also try it. But then again, we also have the, the governance models of communities which are completely non-state institutions in Croatia running the water services. So we have now 400 community water services in Croatia man where water service, running water, is managed by local communities without any, illegally even, without any kind of state institutions or state supporting it. They are now delivering water for 4% of citizens of Croatia, so around 160,000 people. In the Justin Zagreb area, there's around 30 of these water service communities. Sometimes they are governed by the smallest, uh, the, the lowest level of the councils. Sometimes they are governed by citizens associations where users establish legally uh, citizens associations to run this uh, water service. And now all of them, all of these uh, community water services are estab established together an alliance on a national level to fight the state. And why? Because state, of course, wants them illegal. They proclaim that these are illegal practices, that they, they don't satisfy the health standards, and they want to shut it down. They want to either put it into, to etatize it, so to put it into the state system, or to privatize it. But they cannot, the, the state is fighting these uh, communities that they cannot run water by themselves anymore. So, uh, so there are different problems with the laws, and we try to help them uh, to see how, we, how the state can recognize and tolerate what is happening by communities in running these uh, water services. So, um, of course, I mean, the issue is who will, uh, 
who will implement this uh, different, who will transform these public companies, who will, from the government side, you know, uh, recognize th uh, the practice which is happening on a community level and not uh, sanction it. And for that, of course, I mean, we need also political movements inside, I mean, going for elections. And this is what happened in Zagreb just a few weeks ago. We had uh, local elections and the uh, Right to the City Alliance, different social, environmental, cultural uh, movements established a platform uh, which is uh, quite similar to Barcelona and Comú called Zagreb is Ours. And in just in three months of the campaign, we managed to get 8% of the votes and went to the city council. We have four councillors now. We are, of course, the opposition, but we'll now try also from the inside to try to support and to implement these models. Thank you very much. Hello again. When we are talking about state and non-state, it's really very complicated. But as an example, as a model now, non-state <coughs> is in north of Syria. We are practicing it. Although we have a lot of difficulties, challenges, but we started. And we will not stop. North of Syria, of course, you know what's happening in Syria. <laughs> this is the map of Syria, the yellow color, the area which is controlled by the, our administration, we can say, the democratic administration. And now we have a more uh, yellow color. It is now, this one is old one. Day by day, we are liberating many, many areas from ISIS and the terrorist groups. And the black one is representing ISIS, terrorists, and the uh, bl uh, red one is the regime of al-Assad, the other one is the other opposition. Of course, this color is a changeable. One day by day is it changeable. Uh, as in, So, this is the north of Syria. In 2011, started the revolution of Syria, as they call it. But we are in the north of Syria. I can say all over Syria there is a mosaic. Multi-peoples, multi-nations, Arabs, Kurds, in all over Syria I'm talking of it. Uh, Turkmens, Yazidis, multi-religions, Christians, Muslim, Sunni, Alawis, Dursis, Izidis, and all these mosaics are living in all over Syria. But before, we can say before the revolution, when during the Assad regime controlling there, there is only one language, which is the Arabic language. And there is only one nation, which is the Arabic nations. We as Kurds, we are the Kurdish people. We are prevented to talk in our own language, mother tongue. Nobody can speak. We don't have schools. We don't have any things to speak in our language. It's prevented. And we don't have any rights to practice our political you know, uh, activities. Even if you did it, you will be in the jail. 
After the revolution, these people who are living in the north of Syria, we together come to an agreement. The people in the north of Syria, not only Kurds, Arabs, Assyrian, Syriac, who are Christians, Muslims, and even Turkmen and Kurds. All together here, they founded the democratic administration, self-ruled administration. Now in this, all this area, which uh, maybe it makes about 18 and a half percentage of the, all the Syria territories now. All it is now controlled by all these people together, by the Arabs, by the Kurds, by the Assyrian, by the Turkmen's. All together now, they are ruling this administration according to the social contract, which is as a constitution we can say about it. Social contract is agreed by all the people. What again happened? So, we establish the democratic administration, which makes three cantons. Can you? The canton of Al Jazeera, the canton of. Yes. The canton of Kubani. Can you? Did you hear about Kubani? Yes. Yes. No, no, it's okay. And the canton of Afrin, which is the the western side of the uh, uh, the, the red and the, bl and the uh, sorry the yellow one in the western side. So you can now have see yes the canton of Al Jazeera. Please, please, and this one, and the other one, the canton of Afri, uh, Kubani, it is Kubani, and we have the canton of Afrin, this one Afrin. So three cantons we have without any presence for the regime of Al-Assad. No states in these cantons now. We are administrating all these areas together. In each canton, we have councils, the executive councils and legislative council, judicial councils. Executive councils, yeah, in each one we have the, all the components together, they are ruling this. In, ex in the legis legislative council, which is like parliament, yes please. Uh, here is it, the picture would be can shown here. This is the council of the parliament, we can say, the legislative council in the uh, uh, Jazeera canton, and in each canton we have the same things. And we have the women here, equal gender, 50%, not 30%, not 25%, 50%, equal genders in the every uh, situation. Another one, another one, another picture. And we have in the executive council also the same, this one. And we have the co-presidency. In each council we have a man and a woman a president. Not always a, ma uh, a man. In each council we have the co-presidency. A man and a woman, they are the co-president of these councils. And we have the judicial councils. This is the, in each canton we have it. And in each of these, we have all the components. We have Arabs, we have Syriacs, we have Kurds, we have Turkmen's, all the components who are living in this area together. In order to, again, you have that. Yes. In order to have this administration safe, you have to protect it. In order to protect it, you have to have your own forces. So we create our own forces. This is the Kurdish women's fighters, YPG, who were fighting in Kobani and could defeat the ISIS.
And ISIS, till now, they are afraid of this uh, Kurdish woman, really. And this one, it is, she is a one of example of the resistance of Kubani Ari Mir Khan, who has been an icon for the defending for the human rights and the women rights, who could sacrifice herself in order to protect all her groups uh, from the ISIS, they want to enter the, the Kubani city. And she has uh, bombed herself in front of them. These are the YPG fighters also together. All these Kurdish fighters, but they are not alone. We have uh, established the Syrian Democratic Force, which is SDF. SDF, we have the YPG and YPJ, that mean Kurdish fighters, with the, this is the uh, women defense uh, units and the uh, people defense units here, together, Kurdish. And we have another also one, this one together. And we have here the Syriac Council, military council, who are Christians, these are. Together they are fighting shoulder by shoulder with the Kurds. And we have another one, this one, the Syriac. Uh, we have the Sanadid, who is the, uh, Kur the, the Arabs, the Arab also forces, who are also fighting together. These are the Arab forces. All these under the umbrella of the Syrian Democratic Forces, who are fighting now to liberate the Arraqqa city, which is the capital city of the ISIS. Very, very important. Now they entered in this moment, these forces, the Syrian Democratic Forces, they entered the city from the western side and the eastern side. And they are now fighting. In this moment, we are here sitting. They are protecting us there because they are defending and fighting for all the humanity to defeat these terrorists, to defeat these brutal uh, groups who are fighting us in Rojava, in Syria, and they are also coming to Europe. And we have witnessed many, many attacks in Paris, in London, in, in Sweden, in Berlin, everywhere. We, we are seeing, they are threatening us, these people. We are now fighting them in Rojava and defeating them and could liberate many, many areas, these areas which I have shown from the beginning from the ISIS groups. Thank you. This is Arraqqa city. Now the, the color is not like that, of course. It has been now uh, besieged all. You see the woman. This woman, she is the leader of the campaign who is leading Arraqqa forces to liberate it from ISIS. So this campaign is led by the women, which is very important because ISIS, they want to humiliate the women. There is no democracy for them. They are having the women as a slaves sexual slaves, everybody knows what happened for these women in Shangals. So these women, they get their own role in Rojava. So for that we called the revolution of the north of Syria and Rojava, it is the women revolution. Because there, the women, they are playing a very great role in fighting, in defending, protecting, and as well as in politics and here is I'm with the United Nations woman here in New York yes and in also diplomatic we have a lot of women who are working as a diplomats here uh, meeting the Kurdish women meeting with Mr. Holland the president of the France together in the Elysee pa Palace and here also we have the women the woman who is sitting in front, she is the, I can say just in, in, uh, to, to make it very closer, the prime minister of the canton of Afrin. She is a woman. Uh, now we have a co-president co uh, there. Woman, she's taking her role also as a police, traffic police here. We have a civil police sharing a woman everywhere. And we have also the economic, which is the depending on the social economy. 
social economy, we have depending on the uh, cooperatives. We have here women cooperatives. It is very small cooperatives. As a beginning, we are beginners only. Here, the cooperatives of the women. And, but of course, we have a lot of embargo. We have a lot of uh, challenges. We have a lot of attacks against us. Here are the greenhouses for the cooperative also, agricultural cooperatives. And here you can see the IDPs, displaced people, refugees who are coming to our area from the place where is the conflict, there is a conflict. Here the camp of them, thousands, I can say hundred thousand of these people, they are now in our area because it's safer than the other place in Syria. They came from Raqqa, they came from at -Tabqa. They came from the other place, and we have refugees from Iraq, Mosul, which is Mosul now under the attack also. All they come to our area in the north of Syria, unfortunately, no support for all these people. All the camps here we have, thousands of women, thousands of uh, uh, children, but nobody of the organization, international organization, supporting or providing these people anything. We, as the administration, in the north of Syria, we are providing them with water, with clothes, with also bread. Only this, we don't have more. <coughs> <coughs> so the system now is like that. Just in brief, I talked to it. But according to this non-state, this is non-state. We don't have any, uh, you know, a state or nation state, because our system depending on the coexistence, depending on all the people who are living there should administrate themselves. We don't depend on the Kurdish people must administrate. We don't depend on the Syriac or the, the Arabs, no. Together only we can build our city together. We can build it safe, make it safe, and we can have sustainability there, uh, like projects, sustainable projects there, but unfortunately now we don't have support due to the politics or political reasons. You know, the, the regional countries like Turkey, like the others, they are attacking us. Even now Turkey is attacking and bombing our places in Mimbij, which is a very uh, shown, yes, here, and in Afrin, the, the yellow one, here is being bombed by Turkish uh, government there and soldiers. Many civilians have been killed on the border. Uh, many women have been killed on the border just because they are on the border working on their own lands and agricultures. This is what's happening actually. Uh, but uh, if we, we talk about the non state, this is which an example of it because of the, uh, the democratic administration, it doesn't depend on one nation not one religion. Now we have there three official languages. Before we have, when Assad is there, one language, which is the Arabic language. Everybody must read and study in the schools with the Arabic language. We as Kurds, our children, they used to have many, many problems. They don't know how to speak when they go to school. Now we have three official languages, which is the Kurdish language, the Arabic language, and the Assyrian language, which is the Aramaic language, which is the language of the Jesus. Now, it is there in the north of Syria. So, we are now protecting all the religions, <laughs> Muslims and the Christians, Yazidis, and we are protecting all the nations there. And we are having the revolution of women. We have council only for women, only for women, to solve the problem of the women there, to discuss how could the woman take his, her role in, in every uh, field of the life, how could be active, you know. You are now changing the mentality. We are talking about the Middle East mentality, not in European here, you know. We have a lot of differences, of course, uh, for the social differences I'm talking. So because of that, now, the women have empowered themselves, they're working, they are depending on themselves in the defending, in the socials, in politics, and in uh, diplomat. I am, I was 
the co-president of the People Councils of Western Kurdistan of Rojava, and now I am, I am the foreign representative of all this area north of Syria in, uh, uh, of democratic administration here as a diplomatic. So uh, this is what's happening. Maybe if you have any questions, we can also make more. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you Saki, thank you Dom, thank you Sinam. Uh, I'll be, we're behind schedule, so I'll, I'll be quick to explain what's uh, happening now, okay? I know some of you uh, came later, uh, but uh, you should all have one, one sheet like this and one card with a color. Now, um, we'll make groups for debate, okay? The sheet, it's uh, some dimensions to uh, guide the debate that you can, uh, that you can choose, okay? But uh, strategy will be uh, the one that we'd like to focus. And then the colors is because each of the speakers has a card of one color. So you will gather in groups with the color of your card, okay? If you don't have cards, you come and I'll give you uh, one like this. And then each group will choose one speaker that will take notes of the debate and will make a very short, very brief presentation of the debates in which we'll try uh, to take strategies to share from uh, your own experiences as well, okay? If, uh, if I was clear, you can come and pick up and then we can go outside for the groups and also take some air. Okay, everybody's in the room? Okay, I need uh, one speaker, speaker per group. Uh, you'll be for one, you are from uh, Thomas' group. Okay, who's the speaker for Saki's group? You? Okay, come here, you, you will be presenting. And then Sinam's group? 
You, you will be the speaker? Come here. Okay. Uh, just stay there and you come. Okay, then we will... Okay, then we will wrap up uh, what was discussed in the groups, okay? First, a couple of things. Uh, the cards I gave you, those who still have them, if you can leave them here at the end, uh, there will be another workshop in Spanish tomorrow on the same subject and we'll need those cards. Then, uh, I know that the time is not enough. We could be the whole day after those presentations discussing these subjects. It's uh, okay, there was half an hour. If there were two hours, it wouldn't have been enough either. But the idea is that you exchange experiences, you meet each other, you can look for reference, you can, this is the idea. Now we'll go for lunch, you can continue the discussion further, okay? All the contents, I, I will need also your notes back, and we have people taking reports of what was discussed, and the idea is that on your email you can get uh, what was discussed, okay? It's a starting point for further discussion. This is the, the idea of the workshop and uh, wrapping up some tools. Uh, then the, the last thing, uh, you had um, the sheets to write your emails. If any of you haven't uh, wrote your, uh, your email, uh, talk to me and you write it at the end. And then we'll have the speakers of each of the group uh, who will be presenting themselves and uh, sharing what was talked in their groups. Who would like to start? You? I see you <laughs> willing to start. Kia ora. Um, my name's Sophie. I'm from New Zealand. <clears throat> you can put your hand up if you don't, if you don't get my, my accent. <laughs> New Zealand, Wellington, New Zealand. But um, I was with Thomas's group, and uh, yeah, we had a wide range of interests, but um, the qu we basically decided we, w we were looking for questions, common questions. The, the kind of central uh, question that was emerging was how non-state organizations segue with, with, with more uh, formal political organizations and how you kind of retain independence um, against the, the more formal authority of, of state. So. Yeah, we didn't really come up with any answers, um, <laughs> except that we dis we started to discuss mechanisms for analysis of power, and to ask what are the relations that are that are affected by by government. So essentially, um, what does state enable, and what do what is missing, and what is what power is. Um, what is benefit, well, who, who has power and who benefits from this power? So I think it's interesting to do this analysis, actually. I, I, think, I think we came up with really the idea that before we enact any new work as activists, we actually anal analyze the situation um, in this way and essentially dis discern where the power sits. Um, I tried to get an analysis of power, but I, that was a kind of too big for today's discussion. So, yeah, but it, we started describing symbolic relations and essentially how um, we need to really yeah, do some analysis of, about these methods of distribution of power. So I hope that's okay for now. Yeah. Okay, we go, you go second. Um, so we had a, a wide-ranging discussion. I mean, it was pretty big questions, it has to be said, uh, in a very short amount of time. Um, and so there was this question of, you know, if we're talking about this, what is the entry point? What are the vehicles? How do you get people to, to come in to these fights? Uh, and can we use conflict in a way to use this? Uh, and one example given was in, uh, in Burlington, in the US, using uh, sort of agricultural lands and the conversion of uh, industrial areas being gentrified to therefore galvanize people and uh, to be interested in instead creating jobs, the arts and other things um, was quite important. And then this question of yeah, how do we, to bring people in, can we fill gaps? You know, where are the needs? Uh, in Chicago, a very important issue was can we be providing needs where the state is not providing these needs? Um, and that's a way to, to bring people in. Um, housing was another issue. 
Uh, and in London, we had uh, an energy poverty group, is it Fuel Poverty Action? Yeah, um, where they've got now a, a municipal energy company run by London, um, state-owned. Uh, but the question is, is there too much power in the hands of the state? By creating these sort of municipal-owned things, who's the municipality? Uh, and this makes it very uh, dependent on, uh, on who is in charge. Um, but then the example, there was a question of if we are basing it on needs, do we then get pulled into a service providing role and there's no politicization, uh, such as the food banks in the UK, which was a service supplemented state, but it, it wasn't connected to political vision. Um, similarly, there's a fear amongst those working on uh, refugee services and advocacy. Uh, how do you not get trapped into providing services the state should be doing uh, and then just being a, a, the sort of uh, who they give money to, particularly when there, there is money involved? Uh, the financial question is a, is a really tricky one. Um, this was the same uh, with sort of uh, human rights issues. Um, are we not just reproducing the same uh, institutions and same models of exclusion uh, as we as we are the, those we're trying to solve through providing these services and being so linked to the state so the the question of between the state and uh, non-state institutions is of course one of the most tricky ones one of the most tense um, and so we did also discuss very briefly at the very end hybrids what's the a hybrid institution and what are the downsides um, but one of the perhaps one of the things that came out is how do we move away if conflict is a way in and services and needs are a way in, how do you move away from that towards a vision? You know, how do we build towards going somewhere, moving away from service provision towards trying to get somewhere together? Um, and one of the examples given was uh, the, there's a, a network of TTIP free zones, so fighting against free trade, which became, rather than just fighting against free trade deals, something that was looking at what are the positive alternatives we're trying to introduce from re remunicipalization to decent public procurement policies, etc. Um, we could have had a lot more time, and then instead we finished with the question of what is a non-state institution? Um, so maybe that sums it up all together. Thank you. Okay, hello. Um, I'm Maria from Poland, and uh, in a democratic election, I was choose to represent that. <laughs> uh, so what we do, uh, it was uh, just a fluent discussion, I think. Uh, but uh, to uh, to compare to your question about uh, what is exactly the non. Uh, non-state uh, non institution that was also uh, uh, that uh, how non-state institution is uh, connected on disconnecting to the public service and that uh, we have to uh, that non-state institution should uh, take place of that uh, not while uh, doing institution or not uh, but uh, we have more I think uh, differences and uh, more uh, problems with that but we are in uh, uh, the question about that uh, what uh, what you said about the uh, north uh, uh, north F federation of northern uh, syria and uh, that we are in a uh, you know different places different times uh, in that uh, if we build the non state institution in that uh, uh, that factors like a war and so on and may it is a little bit sad, but it is uh, also uh, common to my uh, historical experience with the solidarity in Poland, that, that you have uh, uh, that time to do this, really. And uh, our question was also how to do this in the uh, neoliberalism states and cities and so on, how, how we can build their the non-state institution. And um, I think we have some, um, some commons, maybe value on commons uh, strategy, uh, was were also from the Syrian experience. It was uh, first uh, that we are uh, dependent on the local resources only. So I think it's something which could be common, really, but in the neoliberal states, we need to, first we need to show that needs, yes, that people uh, have to understand that they they can uh, take and uh, take from local resource and uh, they can also uh, do local resource, yes. So it was uh, that one and uh, I think uh, Oh yeah, that what mm, what was is important to develop not state uh, 
institution is uh, people, people with a different profession, uh, which have to decide, yes, in the equal, equal right. And uh, one more, uh, how to start it. So uh, if, if we are not in that, uh, not so serious, uh, serious problem like uh, Syria. Just starting with a um, uh, local community from the small, small things for our school, hospitals, and so on. And I think yes. And I think I finished. Thank you. <laughs> maybe you have uh, something to add. I don't know. Maybe someone wants to add something. Okay, then this will uh, this bring the brings the workshop to a closure. Thank you very much to all of you and claps to all of you. One final thing, uh, remember Karlsbach, if you didn't uh, write your email, uh, talk to me. And then uh, this is my email because not all of you are registered in the in the workshop. So if you need any information, uh, any, anything that you want from the workshop, you can write to my email. <laughs>